Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. The main topic of this video is on the uh, paper that I came across um, in a journal from 2016, and it's by Patrick uh, D. Shaw Stewart. It's called Seasonality and Selective Trends in Viral Acute Respiratory Tract Infections. And the key thing about this paper is that it provides a very plausible and I think the correct explanation on why there's seasonality in the flu viruses, for example. And also, I think that uh, the coronavirus will not act any different. So I think there'll be a seasonality component. Now, I should mention that, you know, so going into the summer, the transmission of the virus should reduce. I think the R value um, will will reduce, but uh, that's not to say that it will drop a huge amount, um, enough to bring it uh, less than one and, and cut off the virus. That can only happen by social distancing or physical distancing and other things, uh, an accumulation of things that society is doing to stop the transmission, you know, lockdowns, et cetera. But it does help. So I'm going to talk mostly about that paper. But the another thing I want to clearly show is that a few days ago, I posted a video about Canada and about the one million Canadians that have returned to Canada from the U.S. over the last week or so. So, you know, it was March break. March break ended on the uh, Saturday, March 21st, Sunday, March 22nd. Those, that's the day when I believe most Canadians would have returned home. So, you know, I did the video a few days ago, and now when I look at the data, the upward slope, the growth rate of cases in Canada seems to me to be um, almost the highest in the world, if not the highest in the world right now. So I want to—I'll show you that data first because it's—I uh, think Canada is in for a rough ride. And if you take a 14-day period from when people are returning, that if that growth rate um, continues, it's happened. It's been going on for about four days. If it continues for another 10 days or so, then, you know, it's going to put us, you know, in, in uh, it's, we're going to pass many other countries in terms of the severity of this virus, the number of cases, etc. So I'll show you that data first. This is the paper. Um, so look it up, you know, Google it, find the paper. It's open source and have a look at it because that's what I'll be talking about the most. But like I said, um, First, I, I'll show you the, well, here's the growth rate here, okay? This is the uh, paper I talked about in the last few videos, COVID-19 Worldwide Growth Rates. The page, it's been updated 28th of March. It's by Mark Handley. I sent him an email to ask him to look specifically at Canada, at the stats because to confirm that it's the fastest growth rate in the world at the moment, which I believe it is, you know, and hopefully he can look at the numbers. But here's Canada, okay, 18.5 days behind Italy. It's a green curve. Look at the green curve. So when I did the video, it was about here. We tapered off, and the data is being updated. Look at this slope here, okay? This, this slope here is a 35% daily increase slope. This is the USA curve here. You know, it was tracking at the 35% rate and then it's dropped off a little bit the last few days. Now this is Canada's rate. I believe this uptick here is due to people, the million people that have returned to Canada after the March break, a million and 37 million. That's about almost 3% of our population came back from the US and this is the result here. I believe. So, you know, let's see if this continues for, you know, if this continues for another 10 days or so, which would be 14 weeks after people return from the March break, this curve will be right up here very quickly. And will it even pass the U.S. curve? You know, who knows? We'll see. This curve's going to go skyrocketing up before it tapers off. And this is because of all the people that traveled into Canada, as I discussed in my last video. So it's very concerning to, to people in Canada. 
Um, so let's see what happens. I've asked for um, the, uh, you know, Mark, the, um, the generator of this page and this data to have a look specifically to put on the, um, the doubling case. I, I believe this curve, this slope here, if you take this slope up, it's probably something like a 50% daily increase. And we'll see if that plays out in the numbers here. So this is the Johns Hopkins University of Medicine, the coronavirus map. You can Google it and find it. The U.S., of course, passed China, Italy coming up to China here. This is from 11.13 a.m. today. Now it's 11.20 p.m. So this is almost, this is 12 hours later, and I haven't updated this, but I'll update it now. Canada cases were at 40, 46. We gained about 500 yesterday and about 500 the day before. So let's have a look here if I do a refresh and see what these numbers come to. So the global case went from 558 to, it climbed almost 40,000 people. Not quite, that's about um, 8% um, in 12 hours. And look at Canada's case. Canada, climbed, we climbed about 700 cases in the last 12 hours. Okay, so that kind of supports the numbers. Look at the U.S., you know, 104,463. Italy, second, you know, 86,500 almost, you know, surpassing China, which, which dealt with the, the virus. All of these countries will be passing China soon. Um, in terms of the slope of the curve on the semi-log plot, you know, if you, if you understand semi-log plots, I mean, this, this kind of growth here, you know, the, the more, this, this, is un, this is unbelievable growth, unbelievable growth rate. And, uh, you know, if this continues for 10 more days, we're going to be way up here, you know, accelerating what passed many of these other countries. So hopefully that doesn't pan out, but, you know, it doesn't take long to see whether whether this uh, continues or not. Anyway, I've sent a link to my video explaining about all of the people coming back to Canada, and hopefully that will be put into the commentary, um, you know, over the next few days when um, when the uh, when when uh, Mark Handley updates the the data. Okay, so let's move to another topic that I wanted to talk about, and that's the seasonality and selective trends in vir viral acute respiratory tract infections. Before I talk about that paper, I just want to define a couple things. So the, the glottis, okay? Um, basically, you know, if this is the anatomy, so you breathe in cold air, you know, if it's cold outside, you're breathing in cold air through your nose and mouth, so it cools these sections, and it goes right down. And this is the uh, vocal cord here. You know, this is the, so it comes like this right here, and there's a thing called the glottis in here. And uh, so that's where that is, okay? And then if you go right into the lungs, the uh, here's the lungs, and you have something called the subsegmental bronchi. So it's near the end. So these things branch out, right? The alveoli of the lungs, it all branches out. And when you get near the end, that's the subseg sub subsegmental part of the bronchi. Okay. So keep those things in mind as I talk about this paper. So basically, the gist of this paper is. You know, how do we explain the seasonality of things like influenza A and B and many unrelated viruses like rhinovirus, RSV, all these different viruses and coronavirus? They share the same seasonality. Okay, they're called, they're grouped as viral acute respiratory tract infections or varies. Okay, they're much more common in winter than summer. Um, and, but, you know, there were some early studies from the 50s and the 60s that showed they used virus strains that were recycled, you know, not natural streams, and they led microbiologists to dismiss the common folk belief that these varies often follow chilling. But today, there's incontrovertible incontrovertible evidence that shows that ambient temperature dips and host chilling. So if you, a person gets chilled, that increases the incidence and se severity of these 
varies. And there's different mechanisms, like one might be, okay, there's more crowding in winter, people are inside, does that enhance viral tr transmission? That's M1, the theory M1. Theory M2 is that lower temperatures might increase the stability of virions. A virion is a virus particle outside the body. Okay, they might last longer outside the body and therefore be transmitted more. M3 is that chilling may increase the host susceptibility. So for example, a person's immune system might be suppressed and that might lead to more um, colds and flus, et cetera, in, in the winter. Um, now, none of those things explain all of the data, but there is uh, the, the fourth thing, and this is what he proposes, is that lower temperatures or host chilling may activate do dormant virions. So the, so, so the idea is that these virus particles are in the respiratory system, the upper respiratory tract. They're, they're dormant. And then when you lower the temperature quickly and get a chilling, they activate and then they give the person the, sick, the sickness. Okay, and it turns out that that explanation seems to be what is going on and will also apply to the coronavirus. So I'll just show you some of the data. So this is uh, some data um, in, um, in Amsterdam, Holland, okay, different, different regions of the Netherlands. And this is the, the data, this is the percentage colds per, th this is the percentage of colds in the population going up here. So we've got, you know, 8% or so here going up to something like 20% here of colds in the population. So these colds peak here, right? They fluctuate throughout the day. And this is inverted temperature. This is outdoor temperature, but inverse. So up here is cold, down here is warm. So when it's cold outside, there's a, the spike in the uh, number of colds. When it's cold here, there's a spike in the number of colds and flu and so on. So the temperature, when, when it gets really cold, when the temperature changes quickly and gets cold, there's increases in the virus. So it shows a clear correlation here. Um, this is uh, in, in, in uh, this is this is some more spikes of colds over time in a couple different places. So this is uh, two different places that are quite far apart in um, they're similar in latitude and they're quite far apart in longitude, but the colds seem to spring up in both places at the same time over wide geographic regions. And this is another case where um, this is cold um, through different years and you, you have um, inverted temperature again. So when it gets cold, which means in, if the temperature is inverted, it's cold at a peak, the, the, uh, the, the number of colds, the morbidity from the colds greatly increases. Clear correlation. This is in the northern hemisphere. We get peaks when it's cold and it's opposite in the southern hemisphere. Okay, so their winter is opposite ours, so that seems to indicate the case. This is the level of, of sunlight. So low sunlight, you get a lot of virus. High sunlight, you get um, less virus, and it's opposite in the southern hemisphere. Okay, um, and I want to just go to the table that summarizes the key features here, if I can get to the table. So here is the four mechanisms to explain the, the vari. Um, chilling may increase the activity of viruses in the respiratory tract as a result of their natural temperature sensitivity. Okay, so it's known that viruses, most viruses have temperature sensitivity. Okay, so there's an extreme sensitivity of the viruses to, of, of people getting sick from these respiratory viruses when there's temperature dips. It's not when the temperature is low and stays low all the time, it's when there's a temperature dip. And this explains the low attack rate of influenza within families because they go out varying amounts and they can get chilled varying amounts. It's, there's a rapid cessation of influenza environment epidemics when the temperature doesn't change. Okay, the viruses go back to dormant again. Um, it explains what's going on in Antarctica in various Antarctic studies, people getting sick there, and it explains how you know, the, the idea of temperature sensitivity and it explains how the virus goes dormant. So basically, you know, M4 is compatible with what is going on and it's the most likely case. So this leads to some interesting things. I think one of the reasons masks work so effective is because they heat the air before you breathe it. So it leads to some ideas on ways to uh, have equipment to minimize getting colds and flus and the coronavirus. Thanks for listening.